So let's go to an even bigger picture. When I said, when does it start? I, I think, you know, when you know, a third of the angels were lost um, and, uh, you know, Satan is cast out, that whole argument was about individual choice. You are going to choose. You are going to, yes, you're going to suffer and you're going to, you know, whatever, but you will have freedom of choice. Satan said, no, 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 you don't want all to suffer. You don't want all of that. What kind of person are you? I thought you were a good guy. Now you're making everybody suffer and you're saying some of us are going to be lost. I'll tell them what to do. I think what we're experiencing now is the same battle that is found in the falling of a third of the angels. And it's the same. I think it's the same argument as well. How do you get a third of the angels who are seeing God all the time, praising him, standing there? They know who he is. How do you get them to turn on him? You have to make him into a monster through compassion. You have to say, he wants some of you lost. He's not going to save everybody. He wants you to suffer. I'm telling you there's a way to not suffer. What do you think of that theory? You're absolutely correct. And and one of the things that you see, and this has been going on for hundreds of years, is this movement to try to make that exact argument, right? God is oppressive. God's got all these mm -hmm. rules for your life. You know, how, how mean of him to say <laughs> that you shall not and you, you must do this. Uh, you know, why not have total freedom? And, and you see, actually, a lot of self-proclaimed Satanists make these arguments. Uh, mm -hmm. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, right? We don't need to obey those silly moral codes. Uh, you know, who, who does God think he is to impose those things <laughs> on us? And, and for a long time, those kind of base instincts, especially in the Western world, were held in check because the rest of society said, no, wait, these are important. <laughs> these are these are good right. things. But now we see that breaking down after a period of multiple generations of constant attack, uh, indoctrination of multiple generations of children. And so we're now moving into a new phase of the battle. But I agree with you. This is all the same struggle between good and evil that's been going on from the dawn of humanity. And um, it's, it's maybe a new phase in that battle, but ultimately the core of the battle is still the same. So when you say Council of Foreign Relations, Bilderbergs, Rothschilds, um, the uh, Club of Rome, those are all keywords to go, oh, and do you have foil on your windows? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, they're all conspiracy. They, many of them, when you say them, they're also a uh, a laser pointer to go anti semite. Um, what do you tell? Take me through those and show me how it's not a conspiracy or what parts are false. Who are they? Yeah, great questions. And, and I would say first of all, there's two ditches that one can fall in on these issues, right? There's, there's the one ditch, and some people fall into this ditch, that these individuals, these organizations are so powerful, they, they practically attribute divine godlike powers. Mm -hmm. Nothing can happen without their permission. Correct. They run everything in the world. And that's ludicrous. Of course they don't. They're not God. <laughs> they, right. don't, they don't control things. Uh, and then there's the other ditch that one can fall in that says, oh, there's nothing to see here. They, you know, that's just a nice mm -hmm. nonpartisan think tank. Well, it's not just a nice nonpartisan think tank. Uh, and, you know, to go back to what we started this conversation with, certainly not everybody who's a member of the Council on Foreign right. Relations, they have about 5,000 members, is uh, an evil-doing conspirator who wants to enslave humanity. Right? I mean, right. A lot of these people are people who would be nice to have a drink with, might be nice to have a coffee with, might be nice to have lunch with. Uh, they're people who believe what they're doing is good. There are people who believe that the world would be better without this attachment to national sovereignty, where more power and responsibility was transferred to international institutions like the UN. Um, but it's a real group. Uh, it has been incredibly influential in setting policy in the United States for generations. Now, you can look at virtually every presidential administration for the last 60 years has been dominated at the cabinet level by members of the Council on Foreign Relations. doesn't mm -hmm. matter if they're Republican, Democrat. You see these people are, they run a lot of the big media companies. They run a lot of the big banks. Um, well, when you find out, you know, anytime Woodrow Wilson is involved, red flags go up. Mm -hmm. But when you see... Why uh, Colonel House, I think it was Colonel House, yep, was Edward it? Mandel that, House. Um, that set it up because he felt the unwashed masses, they don't understand. And the media needs to be on our side. 
So we're going to come up with the policies because we're the elites. We understand it. We'll teach it to the media so the media can help teach it to the people. So it, it's a completely un-American kind of, it, it, it's a brainwashing center, really. Uh, that's how it was designed. Now, I don't know how long it took before it really became that or if it ever fully became that. But that was the beginning uh, thought. Am I wrong? You're absolutely right. And you go back and you look at the origin of the CFR. You're right. Colonel uh, Edward Mandel House was a key player in that. Uh, the reason they set it up is because the U.S. Senate refused to participate in the League of Nations. And they mm -hmm. wanted to build this international architecture. They wanted government power to expand and uh, manage the lives of people because a lot of them were these utopians. They mm -hmm. thought the world would work better that way. And you know, when it comes to this issue of anti-Semitism, uh, really, I think it, it's absurd when people say that some of the biggest victims of these people and these agendas oh, yeah. are actually Jews. Oh yeah. Um, and and you know, when, when you look at the people who are running these institutions, uh, David Rockefeller is a really good example. David Rockefeller is not a Jew. Nobody's ever accused him of being a Jew, and yet he was the chairman of the CFR for a long time, steering committee member on the Bilderberg. Right. Uh, he's he's been a major player in all this. And so when, when people try to say that's anti-Semitic or, or when people try to say it's a conspiracy, I say, uh, you know, we need to define our terms. That is really ludicrous. And even the term conspiracy, this is something that the CIA tried to popularize as a term of ridicule. Mm -hmm. I encourage people to open up their dictionaries. The word conspiracy just means two or more people working in secret on some immoral, illegal or uh, uh, nefarious objective. Right. So there are conspiracies all over the place. Uh, nobody would be surprised to know that two businessmen conspired to fix prices. Nobody would be surprised to know that no. two politicians conspired to get something through the legislature. But we, we're, we're trained, almost like Pavlov's dogs, we're, we're conditioned to recoil in horror when somebody says the term conspiracy. Well, we shouldn't. The Department of Justice charges people with conspiracy mm -hmm. virtually every day of the week in this country. So do state prosecutors. Well, and Cass, Cass Sunstein with Obama uh, you know, wrote that famous uh, uh, argument, academic only, that uh, to discredit people, you have to say this is a conspiracy theory, even if it is true. Right. <laughs> you call it a conspiracy theory because it will sl at least slow everything down. Yep. And they have a new term now that they've been using. I'm sure you've seen malinformation, yes. which is information that's true, but the elites have determined is being put out there for purposes that they disagree with. So it's amazing now that we're in a world where truth is no longer a defense. Right? You, you can't say that even if it's true, because pick your term, conspiracy theory, malinformation, Russia, <laughs> whatever right. it is. Um, and, and I think as people who value truth, we should stand on truth, um, regardless of what nudgers like Cass Sunstein mm. uh, want us to feel when we're accused of being so-called conspiracy theorists or whatever. But there uh, is a difference, right? You said, let's defer, define the terms. There is a difference between a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory. Absolutely. Right? Yep. What is the difference? So a theory is a, a conspiracy theory is a hypothesis or a theory about a possible conspiracy. And everybody comes up with these. I mean, we're, we're human beings, we're not right. animals, so we, we right. notice patterns. I don't think it's wise to promote conspiracy theories unless and until you have evidence proving that it's true. Correct. Um, but the fact that there are conspiracies uh, is irrefutable. You know, to go back to Psalm 2, 3,000 years ago, David was writing about the kings of the earth and the rulers conspiring, is how a lot of translations uh, uh, render that, makes, against God. It's the way humans are. Right. It's the way we operate and you know if you want to define conspiracy only as bad and evil well there are good conspiracies i think as well people that get together and say you know what i think doing x y and z i think the secret part is where it starts to get a little nefarious but we conspire with each other to move things forward and we're always on both sides convinced that it's good yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I think there is something in human nature where sometimes we justify things to ourselves that we know are not right. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of that going on with the elites, you know, to go back to what we started the conversation with. A lot of these guys justify conspiring with each other. And, you know, David Rockefeller actually uses that term to go back to David Rockefeller. If you get his autobiography, if you pick up the original copy, page 405, you'll see he's actually bragging. 
He uses the term conspiring. He mm -hmm. says some even believe that we, talking about the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal, is the term he uses, that we're conspiring against the best interests of the United States with internationalists, or as Trump would have called them, the, the globalists, to build a, a more integrated one world political and economic structure, a one world order, if you will. He says, if that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm. So by David Rockefeller's own admission, he is guilty and proud of conspiring with a secret cabal against the best interests of his own country to build a one world order. Correct. So, so how can somebody say there's no conspiracy? Well, the guy's bragging about it. it mm -hmm. It's a smoking gun confession. What more do you need? I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, professor. I think he was from Harvard, wrote uh, Tragedy and Hope. Carol Quigley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill and, Clinton's mentor. <laughs> right, right. And he comes out in Tragedy and Hope and says, there's this conspiracy. We're going to, wars will change. Everything he outlined is absolutely been happening ever since. And he said, we're doing it to build a more stable world. So there's no more tragedy like World War One and number two. Um, it, wars will be different because we've tied all of our economies together. He was disavowed. Uh, I mean, he I think he was with five different presidents and once he wrote the book, they were all like, I don't know him. <laughs> they really threw him under you know, the bus. Yeah, threw him yeah. under the bus. Mm -hmm. But it's still not well known, um, you know, with the average person that, yeah, they do admit this stuff. They yeah. do admit it. 